Hi, my name is Richard Nea. Welcome to this short video on COVID-19 scenarios, a tool that our research group and many dedicated volunteers around the world have developed to model COVID-19 outbreaks. This video is meant to provide a short overview of what this tool can do, what it can't do, and how to use it. Before we explore the tool, I want to spend a few words on the assumptions our tool makes and how these need to be considered when interpreting the output. Every model has parameters, and we don't know the values of many of these parameters accurately. Some of the parameters have a big effect on the results, especially those that determine how rapidly the outbreak spreads and how effective countermeasures are. Some values will result in a small limited outbreak, while others will result in a massive outbreak with many fatalities. Furthermore, when extrapolating the outbreak into the future, the results will critically depend on assumptions on future policy and the degree to which infection control measures are adhered to. It is therefore important to interpret the model output with care and to question the plausibility of the parameters before jumping to conclusions. COVID-19 scenarios is designed as a dashboard and is best used on a large screen. On the left, you find a number of panels that allow you to choose parameters. One panel contains parameters of the population you want to model. Another, the characteristics of the virus. Yet another panel summarizes the mitigation and the control measures that are in place. We will revisit each of these panels later. The output of the model is shown on the right. The main output of the model is a graph that shows how case counts, fatalities, and hospital demand develops through time. If you mouse over the graph, a little pop-up will show you values at every particular point in time. Here, the solid lines are model output, while the dots are measured of case counts and fatalities in the community you are trying to model. You can enable and disable individual lines in the graph by clicking on the corresponding item in the legend. By default, the plot is shown on a logarithmic scale. This can be changed to a linear scale by toggling this button here. Note this button up here labeled Run Automatically. If this button is checked, then the plot will update automatically whenever you change parameters of the model. It just takes a second or two, for the computation to complete, and then the graph will update. Before we take a closer look at all the parameters that you can change, let's have a look at this dropdown up here. This dropdown contains a list of presets that we have put together for a large number of communities around the world. We could, for example, here sort of type in New York, and you get presets that include the population presets and the case count presets and some epidemiological parameters that fit the initial dynamics of the epidemic in New York. The panel with the population parameter contains as a first field the population size of the community you are modeling. The next field allows you to choose among a large number of preset age distributions for different countries. I will show you later how you can enter custom age distributions if none of these countries reflect what you're looking for. Then we have two parameters that specify how the epidemic got started. So we first need the initial number of cases that were present at the point where you start the simulation. And then there is a different field which specifies the number of cases that are imported from the outside into your community per day. This parameter is only going to be important at the very beginning of the outbreak and is fairly, um, it's fairly unimportant later on when the epidemic is in full swing. The next two parameters specify your healthcare capacities. The so hospital beds here are largely a guide to the eye while the intensive care units that are available actually affect the model outcome and the fatalities. Because when people that are in need of intensive care can't get it, their death rate will increase. The next panel here allows you to choose among confirmed case data from various communities. This is usually preset to the community you are looking at. And the last field allows you to select the time range which you are simulating, where this First, this beginning, this initial date, will have to correspond to these initial suspected cases that you enter up here. This panel up here contains parameters that specify how the virus spreads and how it causes disease. The most important one of these parameters is R0, the average number of infections each infection causes. In a transmission chain, two subsequent transmissions are on average six, seven days apart, and this period, the so-called serial interval, is broken into a latency period of three days and an infectious period of three days. 
You can change these parameters, but these are our defaults. A three-day infectious period does not mean that one is no longer infectious after three days. It just means that most infections happen within a three-day interval. The next two parameters specify seasonal variation and transmission. Seasonal variation and transmission is common among respiratory viruses, but we don't know yet what role this plays for COVID-19. We have then set this parameter to zero, but you can explore the effect of seasonal variation here. The last three parameters in this panel quantifies the burden a COVID-19 infection poses on the healthcare system. Our model by default assumes that severely ill patients stay on average three days in a regular ward hospital before either recovering so that they can return home or deteriorating to a critical state where they need intensive care. Once in intensive care, they stay on average 14 days in intensive care before either returning to the regular ward or dying. The last parameter specifies how much worse the outcome of a critically ill person is if they can't get the intensive care they needed because the hospital system is overwhelmed. This panel down here allows you to specify mitigation and infection control measures that are in place. We've pre-populated this with presets that are, as of now, just dummy mitigations that set in when the case counts pass a certain level. Each mitigation measure consists of a name, a start date, an end date, and a figure that specifies how effectively this measure reduces transmission given in percent. You can remove them or you can add additional measures as is appropriate for your community. We could, for example, here implement a school closure, which went into an effect at some point in March and lasted until end of May with an effect of transmission of 20%. Each of these measures then shows up in the graph as sort of a shaded box that indicates when it started, when it ended, and how effective it is. Our model has a number of age-specific parameters, and these parameters are all summarized in, this, in the panel down here, which by default is hidden. Clicking on the title will unfold this panel and show you a table with these parameters stratified by age group. The first column of this table contains the age distribution, that is what fraction of people fall into the different age groups. This is where you can enter a custom age distribution if the presets that we provide above don't suit your needs. The next column specify how serious COVID is for people of different age groups. Interpreting these numbers is a little tricky, so bear with me for a second. Most data we have on COVID comes from places in which the epidemic started early, mostly from China. The Chinese CDC has provided detailed statistics on what fraction of cases died in which age bracket. But many asymptomatic cases don't enter the statistics. The first column, hence, reflects our assumption on what fraction of cases is contributing to the statistics as confirmed cases. The next column specifies what fraction of confirmed cases fall seriously ill, followed by a column of what fraction of seriously ill people fall critically ill, in the sense that they need intensive care. Lastly, this column here specifies what fraction we assume dies of those that are critically ill. The final column on disease severity is then the infection fatality assumption, which is essentially a product of these four numbers. Lastly, there's another age-specific parameter that you can specify. The very last column allows you to explore the effect of isolating specific age groups from the rest of the population. By default, this is zero, but you could enter a number here that says that 80%, for example, of all 80 plus year old are isolated from the rest of the population throughout the pandemic. After having done a tour of the parameters, I briefly want to turn back to the results section. What you see up here is two additional buttons um, that for once allow you to run the current analysis in a new tab with, a, with the parameters that you have. This is meant to, to facilitate comparison of different scenarios side by side. And then there's a button that allows you to export these results. If we click on this export button, we can pull the data and the analysis in various formats of the, of the site. One would be exporting at a table, 
the tab separated value table that you can use for further analysis. The other one is copying a shareable link to the clipboard that has all the parameters encoded in the in zero. And the last one is sort of a, a print preview option where the entire site along with the table is sort of rendered in a print friendly format. Below the graph that shows the model trajectory through time, you have another graph that shows you morbidity and mortality across different age groups. Here in this graph, the light gray bars are just the age distribution and the population. The other bars show you the peak demand on the hospital system in terms of who is severely ill, critically ill, and the expected overflow of ICU capacities. And then there is a total number of deaths in each age group. So before I close, I'd like to give a big shout out to the team that has made this possible. In our lab, this would be first and foremost Ivan, our software developer, and Nick Noll, a postdoc. I would also like to mention Jan Albert and Robert Dudek, who initially gave us the idea that such a tool could be useful. But this hasn't been only our lab. This would not have been possible without the many wonderful contributions from dozens and dozens of people around the world that have donated their time and their expertise to make this tool what it is today. Thank you very much. And you, thank you for listening. We hope this tool is useful. If you have suggestions, feature requests, comments, let us know on GitHub and get involved if you feel you can and want to contribute. Goodbye.